Good morning, Southland Online. Thank you for joining us for worship through our live stream this morning. Even though we don't get to greet you face to face, we're excited that you're worshiping with us today. Please use the chat window to leave us a note letting us know you're watching or to ask any questions you may have about Southland. We'll respond as quickly as we can. You can also find out more information about our church by scanning the QR code below with a smart device. It will take you to our website, southlandchurch.org. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we want to shower our pastors with cards and notes of appreciation. Please mail notes and cards for Pastor Steve, Pastor Carrie, Pastor Phil, or Pastor Nate to the address provided, or drop them by the church office during the week. October 23rd is a busy day at Southland. At 9 a.m., join us as we pack shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. This is a different time than previously advertised. You don't need to sign up, just show up and invite a friend. This is a great opportunity to serve together as a church and to help bring Christmas joy and the gospel message to children around the world. Then at 5 p.m. we're having a tailgate party and everyone is invited. There will be food trucks, inflatable games, fun, and special guest Kent Chevalier, chaplain of the Pittsburgh Steelers. This will be a great event to invite your friends and neighbors to. Put the date on your calendar and start inviting people today. You can find more details on our website under events. The Refuge is once again collecting food items for Thanksgiving meals for those they serve and have asked Southland to help provide boxed mashed potatoes. Would you consider picking up a couple of boxes of mashed potatoes next time you're at the grocery? They can be dropped off at the church through November 14th. This morning we are excited to welcome two couples as new members of Southland, Randy and Carla Webb and Dwayne and Carolyn Gaither. Maybe you'd like to consider membership at Southland. The next Southland 101, which is the first step to membership, is November 21st. You can find out more information, including registration, on our website under events. Thanks for joining our live stream this morning. As our worship team comes to lead us, let's ask the Lord to open our eyes to something new. It's a great morning to worship our Lord. Good morning. Just stand with me and let's sing together. Express to the Lord today your love for him. I love you, Lord.
Lord, today we love you. What more can we say than we love you? And we come today to worship and to honor you in every way we can. We thank you for your mercy and for your presence. Accept our worship today as we praise you. Accept our worship today from our hearts and our expression of love to you. We give you this time as we come to worship and we ask you to be present. Listen to us. See our hearts. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, for a thousand tongues, sing it with me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim. done for us is shed his blood, gave his body through Christ that we could be redeemed. This next song, thank you Jesus for the blood. I love this song and I hope that as you sing it, it's an expression of your love too. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you had me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide. 
left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope seated. The blood of Jesus. It's what saves us, gives us hope. We're so grateful for that kind of love demonstrated for each of us. Redemption, taking our sin, our debt upon himself. And today we come to remember that. And I hope that you all found uh, a, a communion cup with bread and, and juice in it. For those of you with us online, we hope that you'll get some kind of a cracker or some kind of juice to be able to participate with us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. 
Hopefully you remember the story. Maybe you remember the story that when Jesus was together with his disciples in the upper room, they were celebrating the Passover meal, the celebration of Israel's redemption. And it was during that meal that Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it. Do this in remembrance of me. If you'll open the smaller end and take out the bread, you may eat remembering his broken body for you. And then a little while later, he took a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink it. Do this in remembrance of me. You may drink. Let's pray together. The importance of what we remember, Lord Jesus, is not lost on us in this moment. Your broken body, your shed blood, all out of a heart of love for those who had fallen from you. The world needed rescued, and you came running. And so today, we bow our heads humbly before you, the God of the universe and the Savior of our lives, not only to worship you for who you are, but to share our gratitude for what you have done for us. You have given us hope. You have given us joy. You have washed us of sin, and you have given us eternal life. And so we celebrate this gift with grateful hearts. And Lord, we come today to say, please, speak into us truth that would cause our lives to reflect our gratitude for what you've done for us. We thank you for caring deeply about us, even in our hour of need now. For those who are hurting and suffering, for those who he need healing, we pray for your touch. For those who are grieving loss, we pray for your comfort. For those who need your direction, we pray for the Spirit to guide. But Lord, in it all, our deepest desire is that you would be lifted up this morning and lifted up in our lives so the whole world could see you. Anoint this hour and anoint our days ahead for your glory. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to ask you to stand one more time, if you will. My Jesus, I Love Thee is a wonderful hymn that we've sung. We've kind of reset it a little bit. I hope you enjoy it. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Sing it together. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee.
Amen. You may be seated. It's hard to be judged for one mistake, but it's what I'll be remembered for, I guess. I wasn't always the doubter. That's not who I am. I have a zeal for Jesus. I always have. When Lazarus died, no one wanted to return to Bethany with Jesus. The atmosphere there was volatile and dangerous. Jesus said he'd show us his glory. I assumed we'd all die there. Still, I'm the one who said, let's go. But then, then came this room. the time none of us understood as we sat at that table this is my body this is my blood he raised the dead he, he cast out demons even what could he possibly mean I didn't doubt it when they told me he was dead but how can you not doubt someone coming back to life? Some didn't doubt. But for me, it was harder. Maybe it was just that I didn't want to be disappointed. Many came after me who believed without seeing what I saw. Jesus called them blessed. Yes, I touched the place of the nails, the hole in his side. Such definitive proof that I cried out, my Lord, my God. But that wasn't the only amazing thing. The almighty one, he came back for me. He didn't want to leave me behind in my doubt. He says, I'm worth that, and I'll follow him anywhere for the rest of my life. When I first felt directed to the face-to-face -face series, I knew that I wanted to have Thomas as one of the characters that we would talk about in the series. And then when the whole surgery thing came up, I knew who I wanted to preach about Thomas. A few years ago, I was preaching for a camp meeting in the Promised Land in Ohio, and, <laughs> and it, it was there that I met a Bible teacher. And every morning, this camp had a Bible study, and the Bible teacher that summer was preaching on the doctrine of sin, or teaching on the doctrine of sin. And I couldn't wait to get up every morning to hear about sin. <laughs> couldn't wait. And I, I honestly thought, you know, in all of my theological training, I'd heard everything I could possibly know on it, and then Dr. Chris Bounds opened up my eyes to so many more things and so much more appreciation for what God had done for us through Jesus. Dr. Chris Bounds is the Dean of the Indiana Wesleyan University School of Theology, and he comes today, though, with experience as a pastor, experience as a teacher and a preacher, mostly experience with his own relationship with Jesus. I think the world of him, think the world of you, Chris, I should say, Thank you're standing right here. <laughs> and so thank you so much for coming to Southland to preach for us today uh, on Thomas. Let thank me you. pray for you. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon Chris this morning and pour out your spirit upon us who will hear this word. Open up our hearts and minds to your voice 
through his preaching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome, Thank Chris. You. Thank you. It is a privilege and an honor for me to have this opportunity to not only be here this Sunday, but to be here to close out this face-to-face series Uh, One of my closest friends, uh, going back to my days at Asbury University in the promised land of Kentucky, (laughs) was uh, Keith Koteski, who was here two weeks ago. And then Nathan York, who is here at Southland, who preached last week as one of my former students at Indiana Wesleyan University. So I'm honored to be here this morning and have an opportunity to close out this face-to-face teaching preaching series here at Southland. This morning, our scripture reading comes from the gospel according to John, beginning with verse 24 and reading through verse 31. John chapter 20, beginning with verse 24 and reading through verse 31. If you don't mind, I'm going to invite you to please stand in honor and reverence of the public reading of God's Word. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger Here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let us pray. Allow the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. At Princeton University's chapel, as you enter into the main sanctuary, your eyes are drawn immediately to four large stained glass windows. On the great south window, there is the stained glass that is called Christ the Teacher. In the middle of that stained glass is Jesus Underneath Jesus is the New Testament reference, John 8, 28, which references Jesus' words, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And then underneath this New Testament citation, there is, in Latin, these words, The way, the truth, and the life. Referencing John chapter 14, verse 6. The emphasis of the stained glass is that Jesus is the truth. To the left of Jesus, though, surprisingly, is Pontius Pilate. And to the right of Jesus, there is Thomas the Apostle. Two great doubters represented in this stained glass window are the two roads the two ways of doubt the first is represented by Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18 Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate 
as a part of the legal process moving towards Christ's crucifixion. And if you follow the dialogue that exists in John chapter 18, you will see that there is a perplexing conversation that takes place between Pilate and Jesus. Pilate asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Why have the Jews brought you to be crucified? The conversation climaxes in verse 37 and 38, where Jesus says to Pilate, Everyone who seeks the truth listens to me. And Pilate responds to Jesus in complete cynicism and complete mockery. What is the truth? And even though he has found no wrong in Jesus, he hands Jesus over to be crucified. Pontius Pilate represents doubt as a way to keep from dealing with the truth. He uses doubt as a way of running away from the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. For he recognizes that if he comes to grips with Christ, it will cause him to have to do things he does not want to do. Pilate represents the way of doubt that leads away from the truth, that leads away from Jesus, because the truth costs too much. But on the other side of this stained glass window is the other road of doubt. And it is a way of doubt that leads to Jesus. It is a healthy doubt. It is a doubt that ultimately looks to know the truth and surrender to the truth. This morning I want to spend a few moments reflecting upon this way of doubt that leads to Jesus. And it is the way of the Apostle Thomas. We saw earlier in the video that played just before Steve's introduction. And in the Gospel of John, Thomas makes three appearances. The first appearance that he makes is in John chapter 11. Jesus receives information. He receives news that his good friend Lazarus is sick. And later we know that Lazarus is going to die. Jesus prolongs making a decision about what to do in regard to the news that he has received. And while he is waiting, Lazarus dies. Christ finally makes the decision that he's going to travel to Bethany and visit Lazarus and his sisters. Now, the last time that Jesus was in Bethany, the last time he was in this part of Judea, the religious leaders wanted to take up stones and kill him. And so when he lets his disciples know that he wants to travel to Bethany and see Lazarus, we see that Thomas is a faithful disciple. But we also see that Thomas has this natural inclination to read the worst into the situation. We see within Thomas that there is a natural pessimism that exists within him. He envisions that what happens when Jesus goes to Bethany is that not only is Jesus going to die, but all of the disciples are going to die with him. We see he's faithful because he's willing to die. But we see his pessimism because he is certain that this is going to lead to death. The second time that we see Lazarus, I mean the second time that we see Thomas is in John chapter 14. It is the last supper. And Jesus says to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter 14. And he says, 
Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And I will come and get you so that where I am, you may be. And you know the way. And Thomas is the one who asks the question, Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How are we to know the way? And Jesus responded, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what we see in Thomas is that Thomas is someone who is unwilling to take the teachings of Jesus at face value. When he hears something that he doesn't understand, if he sees things that do not make logical sense, he is going to ask questions. He is going to seek understanding. We're often told Jesus said it, I believe it, that settles it. Not for Thomas. Thomas is not that type of follower. He wants to understand what Jesus means. And if he doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about, he is going to ask questions. So we see that Thomas is someone who's a faithful follower of Jesus. But there's a natural pessimism that he has. We also see that uh, Thomas is someone who isn't going to simply take things at face value. He's going to seek a deeper and greater understanding and comprehension of things. It is now that we come to Thomas's third appearance in the Gospel of John. And it is in this passage that I have read to you. In John chapter 20, we have what are called the resurrection appearances. On Easter morning, Jesus comes and appears, first of all, to Mary Magdalene. And Mary's doesn't immediately recognize Christ. She only recognizes Jesus when Jesus calls out her name, when Jesus says, Mary. And then Easter evening, the evening of the resurrection of Christ, Jesus comes to where the disciples have assembled. They're in a locked room because they still have fear of the Jewish religious leaders. And Jesus appears to his disciples. And you will see in John uh, chapter 20 that he says to his disciples, Peace be with you. And Jesus imparts to them the Holy Spirit. And he says to the disciples, Even as I have been sent, I am sending you out into the world. And in joy and elation and fullness of the Holy Spirit, the disciples leave the room. And because Thomas was not there... The first person they go to is Thomas. But Thomas, who has a natural pessimistic orientation, someone who is unwilling to take what is told him at face value, Thomas is the one who says to the disciples, unless I can see the marks in his hands. Unless I can put my finger where the nails were, unless I can put my hand inside the wound that was given to Jesus by the soldier's sword that pierced the heart of Christ, I will not believe. You see, Thomas realizes that there could be other explanations for what happened to the disciples in the upper room. It could have been an optical illusion. It could have been something that came from mass hysteria as a result of their mourning. It could have been an angel. But Thomas couldn't believe that Christ could be bodily resurrected in the midst of everything that had taken place. Let me pause at this moment 
because I began by talking about this great stained glass window at Princeton University and the two ways of doubt. The way of doubt by Pontius Pilate leads to destruction. The way of doubt leads away from Jesus Christ, the doubt of Pontius Pilate. But I've said to you that the way of Thomas, it leads to life. It leads to Jesus Christ. Because Thomas is, though he is a doubter, he wants his doubt reconciled with the truth. He genuinely desires to know and embrace the truth. My sisters and brothers, this morning, if you follow Jesus long enough, there will be times and places that doubts arise in us. Let me encourage you to choose not the road of Pontius Pilate, but choose the road of Thomas. Seeking to have your doubts reconciled with the truth of Jesus Christ. We also see in Thomas that Thomas is not someone who suppresses his doubts, but rather gives expression to them. Sometimes one of the worst things that you and I can do when we experience doubt in our lives, and particularly doubt about Christ, doubt about God, is that we push down and suppress the doubt in our lives. When so often what we need to do Instead of suppressing and putting down our doubts, we need to allow them to come to the surface, to be brought into the light. I will tell you one of the wicked devices of the enemy. Just as the enemy would have us to suppress and cover over our sin and not bring our sin into the light, so the enemy would work in our lives to try to suppress and keep our doubt in darkness. Thomas shows us the way by bringing his doubts into the light. Because it is only when we bring our doubts into the light that Jesus can come and address them. Thomas wants his doubts reconciled to Christ. He brings his doubts to the surface. And then third, we see one of the things that Thomas does is that he expresses his doubt. He lives out his doubt, not in isolation, but in a community of believers. When you and I experience doubt about God, doubt about Jesus Christ, sometimes what we want to do is sort of run away from the Christian community. We move in isolation. We think, okay, I've got to work this out myself before I can be a part of the believing community. And I will tell you, that is the very worst thing you can do. The best place to work out our doubts, our concerns, our questions is in the believing community of Christ. A number of years ago, when I was in my second year of seminary at Asbury Theological Seminary, I experienced a tremendous season of doubt in which I was doubting the deity of Christ, I was doubting the bodily resurrection of Christ. I was hanging on to my Christian faith by a thread. And I will tell you, for about a 15-month period in my life, the only thing that kept me going were the believers around me. Can I tell you, sometimes... We are carried not by our own faith. But we are carried by the faith of others. There are times and places in our lives where we cannot believe for ourselves. And so we need others in our lives who can believe for 
us. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I'll never forget someone I looked at when I was at Asbury Theological Seminary was Steve Siemens, who was a professor. And I knew that he was far smarter, more intelligent, more knowledgeable than I was, and he believed. I had a small group of brothers that I met with on a weekly basis who prayed for me, who carried me, who believed for me when I could not believe for myself. When you and I experience doubt in our lives, do not listen to the voice of the enemy who would seek to separate us from the believing community, but allow the community to believe for you in your moments of doubt, in your moments of questioning God, and allow their faith to carry you. We also see in this passage of Scripture, Thomas is very clear about his doubt. But you will notice that he has to stew in his doubt. The doubt that he has, the doubt that he carries, is not immediately answered. It is not immediately addressed. Sometimes when we experience doubt, it will last for a season in our life. And we will not experience immediate relief. Our doubts will not be immediately addressed. So Thomas addresses his doubt to the disciples. And then John tells us in verse 26, a week later, as the disciples are once again gathered in a locked room, Jesus once again appears. And it's interesting to me as you look at these resurrection accounts and specifically as you look at this account of Thomas, one of the points that John is making is that Jesus comes where no other human being can come. No human being could just appear in this locked and boarded room, but Jesus can. Jesus can come where no human being can come. And then second of all, you will see that Jesus' purpose in appearing before the disciples at this moment is to specifically address Thomas. I want you to know that our Lord Jesus Christ stoops to our unbelief. He stoops to our disbelief. Our Lord Jesus Christ stoops to our doubt. This whole story that we've read this morning is really nothing more and nothing less than a face-to-face -face encounter between Thomas and between Christ. It is a personal meeting that simply have people around observing what's taking place. And you will notice that not in anger or not in despair or frustration with Thomas, but Jesus lovingly and gently addresses all of the questions that Thomas has. And you will notice everything that Thomas raised. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I will not believe. Jesus says, Thomas, look. Unless I can place my fingers in the wounds that were made by the nails, I will not believe. Thomas, put your fingers here. Unless I can put my hand in the wound that was made by the soldier's sword, I will not believe. Thomas, come and place your hands in my side. And then Thomas said, I will not believe. And Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. I 
I did not grow up in a Christian home. And I grew up in a home that had an agnostic father and at best a backslidden Baptist mother. But I did not grow up in a Christian home. And I must admit, I I spent most of the first 17 years of my life not giving a care or concern about God. But when I was 17 years old, when I wasn't looking for God, had no care or concern about God, one evening as I'm listening to some Christian music, not because I'm interested in the music, but so that I can make fun of the music, All of a sudden, as I am listening to this music, I have an encounter with Jesus Christ. I did not see Jesus Christ, but I had a personal meeting with Christ. And I knew in this moment that I was in the personal presence of Christ. And I knew in that moment that our Lord Jesus Christ was calling me to surrender all and to follow him. When I came to Christ, I want to be clear here. When I came to Jesus Christ, I was not wrestling with some sort of theological proposition. When I came to Jesus Christ, it was not a result of sort of wrestling with some sort of argument for the existence of God or the truth of Jesus Christ. Uh, When I came to, to Jesus Christ in faith, it wasn't because of some sort of teaching that I was reflecting upon in my life. I came to Christ because He, He, He came. To me, I had a personal encounter with Him. Thomas doubts are arrested. Thomas doubts are put to the aside because he meets Jesus face to face. And Jesus, in his personal interaction with Thomas, addresses every one of Thomas's issues. It is a philosopher a theologian by the name of Soren Kierkegaard who said that Jesus Christ meets each of us in the way of life. But Soren says that we can never determine when that meeting is going to take place. Sometimes that meeting takes place as the word of God is being preached or as the gospel is being proclaimed. Sometimes that meeting takes place as we're reading the scriptures, or it takes place as we're listening to Christian music. Sometimes that meeting takes place at a ball game. Sometimes it happens while we're watching TV. Sometimes it happens as we're in conversation with friends. We never know when it is going to be. Just like Thomas But at the very heart of the Christian faith, at the very heart of the Christian experience, at the very heart of the dispelling of doubts and cares and concerns that we carry in our hearts and our lives, everything else around it, but at the very heart of it is a personal meeting with Jesus. And we see that after Thomas meets Jesus and he sees Jesus face to face, he makes this bold proclamation, my Lord and my God. 
I can't tell you this morning how important this declaration of faith is. It is the strongest Christological statement. It is the strongest Christological declaration that we have in all of the Gospels. It is not by accident that John 1, 1 begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, And the Word, that is God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. It is not by accident that John begins there. And it's not by accident that actually the Gospel of John, because chapter 21 is what we would call an epilogue, but the climax of the Gospel of John is, in fact, Thomas's declaration, My Lord and my God. John uses this same expression in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11. And I want you to know it's very clear in chapter 4, verse 11 of Revelation, this declaration, my Lord and my God, is the recognition that Jesus Christ is God. He is Lord. He is Adonai. He is Yahweh. He is the God of Israel who is now standing before me, my Lord and my God. There are two roads, two routes, two pathways in doubt. One is represented by Pontius Pilate who uses his doubts to run from the truth, to not have to deal with the truth. And the other route and the other way is the way of Thomas, who seeks to reconcile his doubts with the truth, who brings his doubts to the surface, That he lives out his doubts in the midst of community. Who stews in his doubts until this moment of personal meeting. My sisters and brothers, my last word to you is this. When you go through your season of doubt and questions, and we all at different times in our places do so, Take the path of Thomas. Take the path of Thomas. And it will lead you to the declaration of my Lord and my God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so this morning, uh, maybe that's you. Uh, maybe you have come in today on the path of Thomas with, or with, with these ideas that you just have to settle with questions that you need answered. And this morning, as we come before him, we ask you to bow your heads and to simply call out to God, Lord, I have questions and I want you to answer them for me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, in this moment, thank you for giving us an example of our own questions, our own doubts. And I pray in this moment, as men and women in this room are now face to face with you, that you would speak life and truth and joy into every heart. I pray that you would help us all to respond with that faith that declares my Lord and my God. I pray you would open up our hearts to the reality of who you are, what you've done for us, and how our lives have purpose and design. Show us the way to you. Would you pray your own prayer in response to what you've heard today? Bring your doubts, your questions to him, even at this moment. You pray in response to what you've heard.
Uh, Lord Jesus, we hear your voice. We sense your presence. We declare with Thomas that you are our Lord and our God. And now we ask that you would bless our lives with your great grace and Holy Spirit. Fill us with passion and desire to live for you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship him together. As we, as we always want you to know, we're here for you to bring your questions to, and we'd love to hear them and talk with you and pray with you about them. So if you'd like to come down here after we dismiss the service, we'd love that opportunity to talk to you. For those of you who are with us online, thank you so much for being part of it. And we want you to ask your questions as well, and they'll be 
information after the service from Hannah and Kaiser to tell you how you can respond to what you've experienced today. I hope you'll do that. Uh, for every To be honest, we all struggle with doubts from time to time. When things don't go exactly how we thought they were supposed to, or we just don't see how anything good can come out of our current circumstances. But doubt means that the door is still open, that you're asking questions, that you're seeking God and leaving room for God to work in amazing ways. Do you have doubts in your life? Maybe you're going through a difficult time right now and you need someone to talk to. Please let us know. Scan the QR code on the screen or text the word prayer to the number on your screen and someone will connect with you as soon as possible to talk and pray with you. If you'd like to participate in this morning's offering, we have three easy ways for you to give to Southland quickly and securely. You can click the Give button on our website at southlandchurch.org. As a new feature, scanning the QR code on your screen with a smart device will take you to that same giving page. You can text the word GIVE to the phone number on your screen and follow the return text instructions. Or you can mail a check to the church at the address provided on your screen. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving to the ministry of Southland Church. Next week, we are excited to welcome special guest Kent Chevalier, chaplain of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who will be sharing in both the 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services. He has a powerful message and you won't want to miss it. Thanks for joining us online. We hope you have a great week and see you again next Sunday.